What would Britain be like today without the National Health Service? Its existence is beyond political debate. Britain's health depends on it. But in the six months before it opened its doors 60 years ago, it looked as though it might never take its first breath. Hated and resisted by the very people who would actually make it work, its gestation was the most fiercely contested in British political history. And its many enemies wanted to crush it before it was born. This is the remarkable story of the battle for its life. In January 1948, Anayaran Bevan, the Labour Minister for Health, made one of the most audacious political promises in British history. In just six months' time, on July the 5th, free health care would be available to every British citizen. The National Health Service was the country's biggest and most expensive social reform ever conceived. Creating it from scratch in mere months would be a race against time, because from the outset, it faced bitter opposition. Winston Churchill's Tory party had fought Bevan's bill at every stage in the House of Commons. Britain was bankrupt after the most expensive war in history. How could we possibly afford it? The British papers were predicting disaster. The public would exploit a free-for-all. But the angriest and most passionate opponents of the National Health Service were the very people needed to make it work. The dentists, the surgeons, and most of all, the doctors. Doctors said the NHS would rob them of their independence and their freedom. They were all set for a fierce battle for their survival. It is we who have the whip hand, not the Minister of Health. He can do nothing without us. Mr Bevan cannot run a service with a third or less of the GPs. With just six months to go, Bevan's time was short. His enemies were gathering strength. Would Britain's health revolution really see the light of day? Before the NHS, the health of a nation was in a perilous state. 1947 had been one of the coldest winters since records began. Snow blanketed the nation. The Thames froze over. And with the cold came the host of illnesses that every bleak winter is prone to. Those who couldn't afford heating were at serious risk. Something had to change. This was the thing the public was so scared about and worried about, the question of health, falling sick, the sort of catastrophes that happened in Vams, the, the economic catastrophe. You know, a man couldn't work or a woman lost her job or the kids were sick. How, did they, how could they face the bills? The NHS was screaming to be done. For decades, millions of British people had suffered illnesses that went untreated because going to the dentist, the optician, even the ordinary doctor cost money that few could afford. When I was a boy, I lived in King's Cross. It was all tenement houses then. We lived uh, pretty rough. My father had been killed in the First World War and uh, then my mother died. So there was a great flu epidemic or something after the First World War. <laughs> 
And I think my mother died of that. It says that on the death certificate anyway. And so I was brought up by my grandmother, who was a widow, and had had 13 children, but only seven survived. I remember once there was a, a doctor at the corner of our street, and I wasn't very well, and my grandmother took me to him. He put me on a table and examined me and so forth and told her what was wrong and uh, said, well, I'll give you a, a prescription. And my grandmother, he said, oh, thank you, doctor. How much is that? He said, sixpence. So she opened a purse and gave him sixpence and he gave it to me. <laughs> so that's what medicine was in those days. I mean, you were dependent upon the goodwill of the doctors. I remember so well how my father, um, in the 1930s, had to suffer um, when there was no such thing as a health service. If you came from the working class, as my father did, the problems then of falling ill were a nightmare, frankly, for most families. Not most families, I think all working class families. Between the wars, working class children entered the world in a tenement or a back-to-back, -back, freezing in winter, stifling in summer. Conditions that bred diphtheria, measles, scarlet fever. Thousands died from tuberculosis every year. A child who survived until 12 was likely to have rotten teeth, poor bones and a weak heart, if they survived at all. We had such seriously ill children and even worse, were the babies who came in with diarrhea and vomiting due to either lack of hygiene or artificial feeding. And they would come in in extremis, grossly dehydrated. As a house physician, I had to immediately set up drips, but there was a very, very high mortality rate. Every morning, we spent some time writing death certificates. Doctors did work in the slums, but very few. London's East End had just one GP for every 18,000 people. In the leafy suburbs, it was one for every 250. It is not to every doctor's taste, said one GP, to work 20 hours a day in the slums to earn as much as he could earn in three hours in a more congenial locale. Essentially, British doctors in the 30s and 40s followed the money more than the medical need. I never remember going to the doctor. The doctor always came to us. I'm afraid we were rather lucky in that way. We lived in Golders Green at that time, that was just before the war. And I choked on a chicken bone or a rabbit bone or something. I got it stuck in my throat. And there was a doctor who lived just over the road. And he looked and he couldn't get it out. And he said, oh, well, I'll give you this address in Harley Street. And we went off to some great man in Harley Street. And he looked at me for about one minute and got it out. I don't really know how it worked because I never know how much my parents had to pay or anything because you didn't sort of talk about it in those circles. For the majority of the population, health care was a matter of charity. Fundraising parades were a regular sight on Britain's streets drumming up cash for the great voluntary hospitals that provided desperately needed care for the poor. You had rag days, you had nurses in the street. In St George's Hospital, the matron chose the most alluring, young, innocent-looking girl to stand in the front hall, shaking a box which was the shape of a hospital bed at the end of visiting time. The hospitals survived primarily on handouts from rich benefactors, but philanthropy alone could never provide all that was needed. Without a radical change, good health care would only ever be for the privileged few.
There must be another way of organizing things, Nye Bevan wrote as a young MP in the 1930s. Born in the South Welsh mining town of Tredegar, he left school aged 13 to work underground in the pits. He saw at first hand what illness amongst the poor looked like and what it felt like. My heart is full of bitterness, he once said, for when I see the well-nourished bodies of the wealthy, I also see the ill and haggard faces of my own people. He lived in, in a house like this, really, in Charles Street. His, his father was a miner, and he died he died from dust, you know, and I, I think that, that got him going a bit as a, a rebel, that they called him at the time. I was a member of a large family, and um, you didn't want to know the days of the week by the calendar. You could, uh, you could tell it by what appeared on the table. Towards the end of the week, the fare was always much more meagre than at the beginning. Bevan's political ideals were carved out at the coalface. He had seen friends lose limbs in accidents below ground, and his own father had died from pneumoconiosis, a lung disease that killed thousands every year. Nye Bevan, knowing all the health problems that the miners had, may have led to the National Health Service by his knowledge of their sufferings, and their sufferings were great. I remember taking a history from one miner who said that he was working in a seam at the coalface, an 18-inch seam, a tunnel 18 inches high, along which he lay on his side all day, chipping away at the coalface. And that was hard. That was appalling in the 20th century to think that this was going on. Yet it was in Tradiga that the seeds of the NHS were sown. Bevan was inspired by a local association that had transformed the lives of miners and their families. The formation of his idea of a national health service, it was actually born in Tradiga, where the local council set up the, the, the special, if you like, a kind of a, a workers' health service there. So the notion of a National Health Service had been burning in his mind for a long time. Miners suffered regular health problems. Their solution was to group together. The Tredegar Workmen's Medical Aid Society was born, a pioneering scheme providing local health care for just pennies a week. Most people in Tredegar and the surrounding valleys were members of the Medical Aid Society. They paid threepence a week on their earnings in the pound. If anybody wanted anything at all, they could get it straight away. It doesn't matter what it was. I mean, if you had to go to London, come to the office, bring your certificate in from the medical officer, pay your fare, pay the expenses, and pay for your hospital treatment wherever you went. I mean, we gave them everything they wanted. We had two surgeries left, dentist, physiotherapist, Chiropody, five doctors, and one chief medical officer. It was the mini national health service. Exactly that. And that's what he based it on as a mini national health service. The nation needs a tremendous overhaul the Labour Party wrote in its 1945 manifesto. Churchill had led Britain to victory in the war, but when the country went to the polls after it ended, there was a new hunger for social change. I think we were really in a somewhat elevated <laughs> moral state. There was a tidal wave of expectation that after the war, everything would be different, 
And that was why we were fighting the war, was for it to be different. The great war leader was deposed because the population wanted social change. And the NHS was part of the social change. Clement Attlee's government promised to build a newer, fairer Britain. And Nye Bevan, above all, claimed this was the moment to create a new society. We have been the dreamers. We have been the sufferers, he said. Now we are the builders. These sweeping social reforms were attacked by the Tories. And Churchill vehemently opposed Bevan's revolutionary ideas from the start. It was always personal between Bevan and Churchill. I mean, if you go back to Bevan's opposition to Churchill during the war, when Churchill was a, the great national hero, in a way, Churchill resented him because he recognized in Bevan a power of oratory and a commanding figure in the House of Commons challenging to him. Aged 47, Bevan was the youngest member of Attlee's cabinet and its most left wing, a self-proclaimed projectile from the Welsh valleys and an unashamed socialist. It seems to me that if we are to safeguard employment in Great Britain, we have to be resolute about it and clear about it and say we can only safeguard employment for British workers by socialist planning in Great Britain and socialist planning in other parts of the world. He was the most marvellous, influential speaker I'd ever heard in my life. He was probably the best in Britain. He only had to go into a room and he... he you're looking over at him, and when he spoke, he could speak like an angel. He enthralled me always. Bevan was never intimidated by hostile audiences. In a way, he almost relished them. He relished heckling, and he dealt with heckling in the most extraordinary, sort of marvellous way. <laughs> If you if you're as quick on the job as you are on the questions, you're pretty good. <laughs> if people were frightened of being sick, Bevan thought, they could never be free. Though much had changed in post-war Britain, good medical care was still the preserve of the rich. He wanted to get money out of the service altogether. It was a, a lump of socialism within a real society that still functions as a capitalist society. He, he saw an opportunity to introduce a wedge of socialism into it. And that was the basis of his political philosophy. The argument that you can leave the market to decide how people's ill health will be tackled was a mirage. There is a school of thought, you know, that believes that if a thing is scarce, it ought to be dear. Although it doesn't cost any more to produce it than if it were plentiful. Now, that's all right from the point of view of orthodox economics. But this isn't an orthodox government, and I'm not an orthodox minister of health. <laughs> On January the 3rd, 1948, Bevan made his pledge to the nation. Free health care would soon be theirs, financed by taxes based on the ability to pay. Yet Bevan had no precedent for the enormous task ahead of him. Six months was no time to set up Britain's biggest ever social reform. How would he equip the hospitals, recruit the nurses, and stop the pharmacies. Most worryingly, he had to win over his biggest opponents, the medical profession itself, horrified by this attack on their privileged world. There was a very 
strong reactionary establishment in the profession. Very elitist. We have, we hold, and we have our boundaries, and nobody shall enter through them. Doctors, like lawyers, were a class apart. Independence and hierarchy ran through the profession from the nurses and student doctors right up to the mighty consultants at the top of the tree in the great hospitals. They were very superior people. They were superior to us as students. They were superior to GPs. Then they were superior to their patients. They, they were on a level of their own and they behaved like it. I mean, the, the ward round was the ward round. With the, uh, we were waiting at the top of the stairs for the chief, and he would arrive, and the whole trail would follow him round, including the nurses and sisters and Uncle Tom Cobbley and all, and he would pontificate. For decades, the doctors and consultants had run British medicine on their terms and done very well out of it. Why now should they change their ways? The rank and file of the medical profession amounted to an army of more than 35,000, represented by a hugely influential professional body, the British Medical Association. The BMA was called, many years later, the shock troops of the middle classes. There was a genuine, fierce battle. On the first day of January 1948, the BMA declared war on Bevan's socialist experiment and set out to persuade every doctor in the land to join them. We are fighting against the enslavement of the profession and are engaged in a life or death struggle for our freedom and independence. How long has all the wisdom on this matter resided with this ridiculous theorist who swaggers at the Ministry of Health? He's so full of his own importance that he's prepared to pit his wits against the accumulated experience of this council, which is to be butchered like a Welshman's holiday. Leading the BMA's opposition was a famously charismatic and outspoken figure to rival Bevan himself. Aspiring conservative politician and secretary of the BMA, Dr Charles Hill. He was extraordinarily persuasive in his discussions and utterances. As an officer of the British Medical Students Association, I saw him uh, just as I attended meetings at BMA House. Um, and uh, at first I swallowed uh, really almost totally the BMA view about the potential iniquities of a whole time salaried service, which is the thing that they feared most. And Charles Hill was particularly outspoken about uh, control of the profession by government. We all want better health services and better health. But in organising them, let's make sure that your doctor doesn't become the state doctor. Your servant, the government servant. The fear was that this was state medicine. They wouldn't be freed. The idea that doctors would be um, somehow manacled within a state system of medicine um, was, was completely anathema to them. The BMA could not have had a more powerful spokesman for their cause than Charles Hill, because he was the most famous doctor in the country, dispensing medical wisdom to over 14 million people every week as the BBC's radio doctor. What can you do if you get an attack of influenza? Well, there's no panacea, there's no golden remedy. Don't believe all the neighbours say about what to such and such a stuff has done to them. Bed, warmth. Extra hot water bottle, extra blanket, so that you perspire. Drink he had this very sort of gravelly, avuncular tone and talked to people about having their bowels open and sitting on the throne and so on. That's the way I remember. And people thought, ah, oh, yes, he's a real family doctor who understands everything that goes on. And they did sort of listen to him. 
And uh, remember this, you're not a hero if you go dodging off to work with a cold or influenza. You're only... He was very reassuring. He was a good father figure. And his voice was modulated and seemed to make sense. I went all the way with Dr. Charles Hill in the early days. Until I realised his views on the National Health Service. Make the doctor not your doctor, but the state's doctor. No longer your friend, your advocate. And you'll have done some damage to medicine that it will be impossible to repair. The doctors believe that their freedom as a profession and as individuals, that it's your freedom. And that's what they're fighting for. More than half the BMA's members were GPs, who were terrified that the NHS would lower them to the status of medical civil servants. The BMA encouraged them to reject Bevan's Health Act, as it would rob them not only of their independence, but also their livelihood. Doctors were known as independent contractors. You know, they ran their own lives, they ran their own surgeries, they ran their own practices. And this was what worried them when the talk of state medicine coming in. My husband was his own boss. And if he came under a state organisation, he would cease to be his own boss. My father was very active in the British Medical Association. The coming of the health service filled him with great uncertainty. They might be led into a, a system where the doctors became state employees and they became beholden completely to government direction, almost like the military. And I think he was very worried that there could be what we'd call now a dumbing down of medicine. Don't forget, before the NHS came in, GPs purchased their practice. They had therefore had a capital interest in the practice uh, and hoped that when they retired they would be able to sell the practice to somebody else. So there was a financial uh, reason too. It's obviously quite a job sending out the BMA plebiscite to 56,000 doctors, asking them, roughly speaking, whether they approve of Mr. Bevan's scheme. In the middle of January, the BMA launched a counter-attack to Bevan. They decided to put the views of all 35,000 members to the test in a vote, a plebiscite. If the doctors voted against the NHS, Bevan would have no workforce to power his health service. Simultaneously, leading opponents fired off a salvo of furious letters to the national press to whip up a frenzy and persuade every doctor in the land to vote no. Our independence will have been sacrificed to a soulless machine governed by ex-miners, trade unionists or even Marxists. It is essential we fight this proposal with all the resources at our disposal. There were some quite vitriolic attacks upon the government as a whole and upon Anorin Bevin personally, where they said that the government were setting out to destroy medical practice in the country forever and for the future. The state medical service is part of a socialist plot to convert Great Britain into a national socialist economy. The notion of, of doctors being dragooned was very much the sort of notion that was being put to the profession by the BMA. You know, so that you do what you're told, you are no longer really in charge of what you do with your patients. The government gets between you and your patients. The attacks became very personal. I think they believed that to make a point you had to be forceful to the extent of sometimes being offensive. The bill can be written in two lines. I hereby take powers to do what I like. Signed, Nye Bevan. Führer. The BMA's battle over the NHS looked like a class war and Bevan was a lightning conductor for the fury of the profession, the press, and opposing politicians. He was a fierce at times and really quite intense 
Welsh demagogue. Oh, he was hated. To the people who opposed the NHS, he was seen as the Satan's architect who was driving it along. He was utterly reviled by, the, by some parts of the profession. He was a tough negotiator, and people really felt bruised after they dealt with Knight. My husband was a member of the BMA. They used to have an annual conference, and I remember being with a group of wives, and one of them said, told me that she had got a solemn promise from her husband that in the event of an Iron Bevan becoming prime minister ever, they would emigrate. And this was serious. They, she, they couldn't stand him. The BMA had even gone so far as to compare Bevan to Hitler, a comparison Bevan's arch-rival Churchill would have approved of, having previously equated socialism with dictatorship. No socialist government could afford to allow free, sharp or violently worded expressions of public discontent. They would have to fall back on some form of Gestapo. And here was Churchill suggesting that the Labour Party would establish a society which would include Gestapo operations, etc. I think it's inconceivable that the BMA being what they were, a very powerful, orthodox, establishment institution, it's inconceivable that they would not have recognised in what Churchill was saying, ammunition for their campaign. On the 9th of February, Bevan fought back. His stage was Parliament. For the first time in its history, there was to be a fourth reading of a parliamentary bill. Bevan was determined to show that parliamentary sovereignty ruled the country and not the BMA. We ought to take pride in the fact that, despite our economic concerns, we are still able to do the most civilized thing in the world. Put the welfare of the sick in front of every other consideration. I hope the House will not hesitate to tell the British Medical Association that we look forward to this act starting on the 5th of July. Bevan secured the support of Parliament, but the BMA's resistance intensified. Local branch votes were organised across the country to stoke up the opposition. In Newcastle, London and Liverpool, the NHS was rejected unanimously. In Brighton, 350 voted no against a single lone supporter. It took courage for any medic to speak out in favour of the health service. But a minority did brave the opposition. Among them a young nurse, Avis Hutt, and her surgeon husband, Roscoe. There was not much point in anyone arguing with me about not wanting the health service because I was a public uh, rebel agitator poster carrier, tub thumper, soapbox orator. So I would argue in favour. My husband was committed to the notion of a unified health service, free at the time of use. There was a big meeting of the BMA in Birmingham, which was Chamberlain country, and my husband attempted to defend the act. He came back absolutely shattered, pale and shaking. They had howled him down. Many supporters of the NHS were young students who had joined a radical group called the 
Socialist Medical Association. In the hostile climate of 1948, they were branded as traitors. My impression was that we were a persecuted minority and we were quite marginalised. There was a very vocal opposition who were very aggressive and they would single out students who they knew supported the NHS and we were pilloried, I was. Uh, you know, uh, you, you'd have 50 or 60 other students ranged behind you in a lecture theatre and the professor pointing his finger at me and <laughs> saying, I remember your parents, they were, they were reds and so on. Uh, we were, felt quite singled out. As a medical student at St Mary's, I was called a commie by everybody. I wasn't one, but they called me one. What the hell do you think you're trying to impose on us, they would say. Um, you know, you'll have us marching up and down the street as if we were in the army, signing things which we're told to sign. You know, you'll be militarising medicine. That's all you want to do. In mid-February, with some four months to go before his NHS was due to open its doors, the doctor's verdict was ready to be announced. Bevan knew the moment of truth was imminent. The BMA's members' votes were counted in a sealed room. It wasn't long before Bevan discovered the scale of his defeat. Rejection followed rejection followed rejection. More than 30,000, over 85% of the poll, voted against joining the NHS. It was a disaster for Bevan. The voice of the BMA had become stronger and louder than ever. Let me ask how you propose to work the medical service without doctors. You can't bring in the troops or anything like that. Let us realise that this temporary Minister of Health is only like a very difficult patient determined to get his own way by whatever means. But this totalitarian socialist government will soon be superseded. Bevan faced a crisis, personally and politically. No doctors meant no health service. His critics began clamouring for his resignation. Now I can sympathise with that fellow Sisyphus. With his bloody boulder. Two days after the plebiscite result, he was scheduled to speak in South Wales to his own people. The country would hear him too. There would be no backing down. No matter what harsh words may come from the mouths of the great, kind words lie in the mouths of the weak and the sick and the poor, who will now have access to what was formerly held from them. When I hear the cacophony of harsh voices trying to intimidate me, I close my eyes and listen to the silent voices of the poor. Bevan had this remarkable capacity of being able to persuade people that their dreams were realizable. The country was at that time being bombarded with a lot of, and not just anti-Bevan personally, but anti, anti the NHS as an idea. Socialized medicine, horrible, just imagine it, and trying to frighten people. What I think they misjudged was that there was an enormous support in the country, particularly, not just the working class, often among the middle class too, who had remembered how difficult it was before the Second World War. In 
support for Bevan's plans was crucially underlined at the start of March, when Gallup published an opinion poll on the National Health Service. In a post-war grip of shortages, rations and endless queues, life in Britain may have looked grey, but the mood was optimistic, excited about the future. The poll revealed overwhelming public support for the NHS. Only 13% were on the side of the doctors. Strengthened by the enthusiasm of the British public, Bevan made the most audacious move of his political life. In a bid to undermine the BMA, he went over the heads of the ordinary GPs who'd rejected him and straight to the door of the grandest doctor in Britain, Lord Moran, the president of the Royal College of Physicians. It was the last roll of the dice to see if he could turn defeat into victory. Lord Moran was a, a, a rather lordly figure. He presided over the affairs of the Royal College of Physicians with a very firm hand. I think he served for longer as president of that uh, uh, London Royal College, longer than, uh, than any other president in recent memory. Lord Moran, it was sometimes said, was the only doctor in the country with just one patient. But what a patient. My father was notable for looking after Winston Churchill with no notice. I mean, Winston would suddenly say, you know, we're off to um, um, where it was, Greece or, or Moscow or somewhere like that. And um, uh, off he went, you see, with his patient. Yet Churchill and Bevan were still bitter enemies. A petrified adolescent, Bevan had called Churchill. The minister of disease, Churchill spat back. By going to Moran, Bevan was marching into the heart of the enemy camp. If he could win him over, then the rest of the profession might follow. But Moran was as cunning as Bevan. Lord Moran, his nickname was Corkscrew Charlie because uh, he was so devious. He was devious, but he was a politician, a medical politician. I can remember uh, Nye Bevan coming to 129 Harley Street and he had a terrible cold and uh, so I fixed him a whiskey toddy. And he liked that and um, uh, he said he liked another one so I made him another one. <laughs> My father liked him. Right from the beginning he felt that he was a reasonable man and he was a highly intelligent man. A man with whom it was possible to do business on, on this sort of question. And I don't think it ever crossed his mind, you know, where, where he'd come from or anything. It was, it was totally irrelevant. As president of the Royal College, Lord Moran controlled the most prestigious medical group in the country, the consultants. They were the least likely conscripts to a nationalised health industry. For decades, they had been in charge of Britain's great charity hospitals, such as Bart's, St Thomas's and the London Hospital. But Bevan knew their Achilles' heel. Their famous hospitals were broke. Charity never provided enough. If he could find some way to pour the state's cash into the hospitals and let the surgeons keep their freedom, maybe, maybe Moran would help. Lord Moran realised that Nye Bevan was giving the consultants control over the means of production of health care. Uh, they couldn't afford to provide hospitals and x-ray plants and laboratories and so on. Only the government would do that. Uh, so really, uh, uh, it was in their interest to come on board. And when they, they were told, and you can still have your pad in Highley Street as well, well, why not? To clinch the deal, Bevan made Moran a very enticing offer. The consultants could have it both ways. They could work for the state, and, if they so chose, carry on making lucrative money out of private patients. Uh, and Aaron Bevan was able to agree uh, that the consultants could be held time if they so wished and would be paid a salary in the teaching hospitals for the first time, but that they could also be part-time and be paid a part-time salary and continue with their 
private practice uh, on a sessional basis. Uh, and it was an Oren Bevan who said, uh, I stuffed their mouths with gold. Basically, Bevan had the ability to buy folks off. Uh, he said to the London consultants, yes, I accept that you're going to lose private practice. Yes, I accept that it's hard getting to the top of the ladder. So why don't we have a system in which the really superior doctors pay double the rest? And who will decide this? You'll decide it, not me. You are the professional people who can judge who is good. With time running out, all Bevan's hopes for launching on July the 5th now rested with Moran. But there was a problem. Moran was up for re-election. His position as head of the Royal College faced an imminent challenge. It came from Lord Horder, the King's personal physician, and one of the most die-hard and outspoken opponents of Bevan's National Health Service. Lord Horder came out with a de declaration that the idea of a national health service that Bevan was proposing was, as he put it, the mad march to totalitarianism. And this was the attitude... Uh, Horder was an extremist, of course. But he also represented a very large slice of the medical elite. came to a head in the annual election for the presidency, which took place once a year, with probably about 300 fellows attending. And he regularly stood against my father. And um, for about nine times running, I think. Moran routinely defeated Horder by a majority of 10 to 1. But in 1948, with Horder campaigning on an anti-NHS ticket, this vote would determine not just the presidency, but the very survival of the NHS. To elect the president, you had to go to their college building in London. The place was packed. Every possible person came. And um, there was a very, very tense and dramatic election. You then cast a piece of silver for the candidate you wished for. The registrar read them all out one by one. Moran, Horder. Moran, Horder. It was very tense. Everybody was on the edge of their chairs watching what was going to happen. And there was a moment when there were five Horder votes in a row. Horder, 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 Horder. Really looked as though that, that was it and Horder was going to make it. Horder. It was absolutely touch and go. The final vote was 165 to Horder and 170 to Moran. The future of the NHS had turned on five consultants' votes. Moran would now lead them into the health service. The amazing thing was that uh, Bevan turned out to be somebody with whom you could do business. He actually listened. People went into the room with Bevan thinking that he was going to be a rough, tough street fighter and below the salt. They found this pleasant charming man who could whistle the birds down from the trees, who listened, who would in fact accommodate you whenever possible. But what about the GPs? Moran now wrote to Bevan with an audacious suggestion of his own. My dear Nye, the irrational fears of the GPs that they will become slaves is based on their fear that one day you will turn them into full-time salaried servants of the state. You could eliminate To get the GPs on board, Bevan should amend the NHS Act to guarantee he would never reduce them to civil servants or wage slaves without launching an entirely new Act of Parliament. I would, of course, support you in the House of Lords. Two days later, on the 7th of April, Bevan made this amendment in the Commons. Moran applauded him in the Lords. Their deal was finally sealed. <laughs> 
Bevan's sudden political compromise should have been welcome news to the doctors and the BMA. But far from caving in, they simply dug their heels in further. With a fighting fund in place, now they were threatening to strike rather than sign up to the NHS. Facing continued resistance, Bevan kept his cool. He ignored their threats and announced louder than ever that his health service would start, as promised, in three months' time. Even though not one doctor was on board, a massive public information campaign was launched to educate the public about the glories of the NHS. On July 5th, the new National Health Service starts providing hospital and specialist services, medicines, drugs and appliances, care of the teeth and... Bevan believed the doctor's resistance would crack if they faced a groundswell of public demand. His trump card was the unique selling point of the NHS. Everything would cost nothing. Are you sure I don't have to pay anything for all this? Nothing. You and your family, having put yourselves on my list, Get all the general practitioner services free. You've got your doctors, you've got your opticians, you've got your dentists. It just wasn't sort of just the doctors, you've got the whole lot thrown in. Following the first wave of publicity, over 20 million people signed up for the new service. Bevan's target was higher still, to get 90% of the public registered by July the 5th. When you're ill, you won't have to pay for treatment. I don't have to pay the doctor now. I'm on the panel. Yes, that's true. But your wife and children aren't. The panel system... The advanced publicity hit home most strongly with one crucial section of the audience. Women. Suppose your wife falls ill suddenly. For generations, they had been last in line when working-class families spent precious cash on health care. Bevan spoke particularly about what he called the silent majority, that is, the women's health was very much impaired by constant child-rearing because there was no access to free contraception. And were worn out with their gynecological problems and their anemia, and there was no health care available to them. Bevan also knew the strongest argument for the health service was that it would dramatically improve the lives of Britain's children. With child mortality still a grave concern, up to 10,000 a year dying from diphtheria alone, this was a compelling reason for signing up. This boy is not expected to live. He was not immunised. I remember as a child going to a children's movie morning, Saturday morning, and there was an advert which said, uh, every 40 minutes a child dies of diphtheria. This child need not have died. Just the sort of thing to cheer up a child on a Saturday morning. But the object of that was not to teach you about diphtheria, but to get you down to the clinic for diphtheria immunisation. He could have been immunised and so protected against diphtheria. You can get all of your people immunised, free, and you can wipe diphtheria measles from the streets. Stop this needless death. The campaign was a masterstroke. Within five weeks, 75% of the British public had filled in NHS registration forms. It was an unpleasant dose of reality for the BMA. Their resistance was totally out of step with millions of British people. In desperation, and unwisely, they arranged a second plebiscite. The majority of doctors were still against signing up, but almost 40% had changed their minds and now voted for the NHS. The tide was turning. My attitude was totally transformed because at a time when people were paying their doctors, the GPs, I saw one or two children 
uh, who'd suffered appendicitis and in whom the appendix had perforated because they had abdominal pain and their parents had given them castor oil because two pennies of castor oil was cheaper than the doctor. And it was that kind of experience which persuaded me to change my view. They were persuaded in the end and I think they began to see that there were limits to the amount of resistance they could put up. The number of Britain's doctors bowing to the inevitable was rising daily. It wasn't long before those who held out began to fear that they might be losing out. Now don't forget, choose your doctor now. The doctors were scared once they found that the dam was being breached. You had hungry doctors who needed a living. And if in a small town, three out of the 10 doctors decided to sign up with the National Health Service, their practice will immediately swell and they will have a guaranteed income. The other seven doctors will see all of their patients trooping off. So it's a, rather like a domino effect. Forced into a corner with just five weeks left before July the 5th, the BMA finally advised all remaining doctors to join the NHS. It was a retreat, but not a surrender. They now switched tactics, hoping still to scupper Bevan's plans. Knowing how much political capital Bevan had staked on July the 5th, they called on him to delay. The start date was unrealistic and impractical. Nothing would be ready. Bevan should push it back or face chaos. Bevan had a, a task uh, and a reputation. Because if he didn't get the health service in, he was doomed as a politician. A lot of people felt that he might say, OK, let's delay it for six months. He was absolutely insistent that do it now. A delay he would regard as a sign of weakness, a sign of doubt. Uh, and that would strengthen the forces, the strong forces, that were opposed to any form of National Health Service. So a delay would, in fact, be a serious retreat. Some of the doctors have been suggesting that the introduction of the National Health Service should be postponed because there is a shortage of nurses, doctors, dentists, uh, hospital equipment and things of that sort. That is a lot of stupid nonsense, for we shall never have all we need. Indeed, if we are short, it is all the more reason why we should use intelligently what we have got. Bevan was too proud a politician to back down now. But privately, he knew there were serious hurdles to overcome. His six-month timetable was far too short to deal with the practicalities of launching the NHS. In just two years, the estimated start-up costs had almost doubled to £180 million, the second biggest charge to the Treasury after the military. Britain's existing medical services were desperately ill-equipped to meet the impending demands of the new service. Most of our 3,000 hospitals were crumbling, either from age or from the Blitz. There was not a single hospital in London that escaped bomb damage. Uh, I, during the war, was living in Manchester Salford, and the bombers came over for the Salford docks, and one night they took out an entire wing of Hope Hospital Salford, leaving bare ends of a corridor and a fair number of dead nurses and dead patients where a three-storey wing had just disappeared. No amount of improvisation or re-equipping can expand these Victorian walls. This corrugated iron shed was built in 1918 for war casualties. I worked as a theatre orderly and as a ward orderly. 
in an old workhouse hospital and three years after the war, there was corrugated iron covering the passageway where the block had previously stood. So it was in fact possible to push a patient on a stretcher underneath the corrugated iron across the area of bomb damage down to the operating theatres. With just five weeks to go till the NHS opened its doors, Bevan's problems continued to get worse. It wasn't just the buildings and equipment falling short. He still had only a small proportion of the staff the NHS would need. Nurse. Nurse Edwards, can you go to her? Our nurses are busy and overworked because there aren't enough of them. Many hospitals have closed wards because of that. A last-minute campaign was launched to find 30,000 new nurses to tend to almost 400,000 hospital beds. Who will help? You will? Good. But you can't like that, you know. Ask at your local Ministry of Labour office or a hospital for details of how to become a nurse. There are 30,000 needed. The pressure on Bevan continued to mount to the bitter end. Now the press was on his back, predicting another disaster. They claimed that free health care to 50 million Britons would result in an anarchic free-for-all. They forecast that the service would break down under the onslaught. Suddenly it was free, uh, so obviously... Uh, it was like making ice cream free. I mean, if you didn't have to pay for your ice cream, everybody would eat enormous quantities of ice cream. As Bevan's appointed day approached, apprehension turned to nervousness. Would the hospitals come up to scratch? The nurses be trained? Or would everything fall apart as demand soared overnight? All eyes were now on the health minister. With less than 24 hours to go to the crucial moment, Bevan went to speak at a Labour rally in Manchester. It should have been a speech of victory. He had defeated fierce opposition and brought down the doctors. But for six months, his resentment and rage had been boiling. He let rip with an unprecedented tirade against his most hated enemy of all, the Tory party. That is why... No amount of cajoling and no attempts at ethical or social seduction can eradicate from my heart a deep burning hatred for the Tory party that inflicted those bitter experiences on me. So far as I am concerned, they are lower than vermin. They condemned millions of first-class people to semi-starvation. The impact was instant and disastrous. Within hours of the speech, the newspaper headlines led not on the doors opening to the NHS, but on the minister's dramatic insult to half the nation. Even though Mr. Bevan calls us vermin, we must regard them as brothers with whom... <coughs> yes, certainly. We must regard the other half of our fellow countrymen as brothers apart from their politics, and realize that we have much in common. Bevin's vermin speech echoed down the corridors of time. There were numerous attacks and some pretty vile ones too. The house he was living in with his wife Ginny Lee at that time. Human waste was put through the letterbox. Never actually left him, that ghost of the vermin speech, 
was always haunting. He was the object of a lot of personal vilification for a long time after that. Bevan's speech had threatened to overshadow the birth of his service. But throughout Britain, the medical profession, many of whom had resisted him, worked to the last minute in preparation for the potential flood of millions of new patients. Time had come. Finally, on the stroke of midnight on July the 5th, Bevan's dream became a reality. The National Health Service opened for business as promised. At 30 seconds past midnight, there's a telephone call. Mrs. Bloggs, my child is very ill, come at once. I had a bed, a car, Drove to Mrs. Bloggs, knocked on the door. Hello, what's the trouble? Ah, oh, I just wanted to see if the NHS works and you'll come out. I will claim to see the first NHS patient. That morning, all over the country, 50 million Britons woke up to a new world of free healthcare for the masses. My grandfather wrote a book, the National Health Service in Great Britain. On the morning of the appointed day, 5th July 1948, the whole gigantic scheme wheeled into line. It was like the slow opening of the immense hydraulic doors of the vaults of a great bank. Hello, surgery switchboard. Hello, outpatient appointments. Yes, you could see Dr. Midgley this afternoon at 2.20 or one of the other doctors this evening. I rode my bicycle and I got to the turn-off, which would take me up East Street, where the surgery was on the corner, and there were all these people. There must have been 30, 40 people all queuing up to go in. So I opened the door with trepidation, I might tell you, and ran up the stairs like a bat out of hell before these people followed me up. It was quite frightening, I'd be perfectly honest, because I didn't know what was going to happen, I have got a clue. Our little waiting room was full to overflowing, and we got people on the landing and down the stairs. With the NHS less than half a day old, Bevan paid a triumphant visit to Trafford Park Hospital in Manchester. I don't think these days you'd see the excitement that happened on that day. People were so proud of it, and they were so proud that they picked Manchester. It was like a wedding. People went out and, uh, like the consultants, they, they bought the best clothes and whatnot. And uh, Merton had a new uniform, and the nurses were, and their aprons were starched to the left. There was no pomp attached to Nybev and he didn't miss anybody out and smiled all the time and didn't appear to rush anything. And if he missed anybody out, he went back to, to shake hands with them. They couldn't believe that a minister could behave as normal as he did. Everybody was waving banners and thought that... Uh, <laughs> that the Lord had come near me. <laughs> yeah. Bevan toured the hospital like a proud father. He stopped off at the bedside of a 13-year-old patient, Sylvia Diggory, and posed for an historic photograph that came to symbolise everything he had fought for. So many of the opponents to the NHS had given him very bad publicity. So I suppose, in a way, I was expecting someone who would be rather like a, a typhoon descending on us, you know, rather full of his own importance. He was charming, absolutely charming. He had a very nice, lilting voice. He spoke to me, you know, not as a child. There was no speaking down. He was pleasant to everyone. 
And he was absolutely euphoric. He'd a very happy man. Against all the odds, Bevan had delivered, both on his six-month timetable and on the basic promise of the NHS. Comprehensive health care for every person in Britain was now completely free, from the simplest ailment to the most urgent surgery. That was the big change, that you didn't ever have to ask people who's paying. People were absolutely delighted to find somebody who gave what appeared to be a private service on the NHS that they didn't have to pay for. I actually had a brass plate made, with, engraved on it was, no private patients. I was very proud of that. Patients were so touchingly grateful and appreciative of anything and I was very touched because they kept giving me as if I was responsible for it they kept giving me little gifts the public embraced Bevan's free health scheme with open arms the NHS's opponents had predicted it would be subject to abuse at first it seemed they may have been right people began coming in with lists of things they wanted on the free prescriptions Cotton wool, aspirin, a uh, bottle of gin. <laughs> there were frivolous demands. There, there were a few people. That you've got to remember, this is a time of great shortages, uh, clothes rationing and so on, as well as food rationing. You'd get people who wanted to get rolls of gauze to make net curtains out of. But uh, the overwhelming majority of people uh, realised that if the NHS is an expression of solidarity, you can't afford to have people thieving from it. But more seriously, the NHS was buckling under the sheer weight of demand. The demand of countless illnesses and problems that had gone untreated. Because, until now, patients couldn't pay the price. All sorts of things crawled out from the woodwork where as soon as uh, people recognised that they could get to the doctor and be seen, they came, and the amount of unrecognised disease that there had been around uh, was just, just breathtaking. It was quite clear that we were now tackling the problem as it should really be tackled. There was a colossal backlog. Women going around with their uteruses turned inside out, uh, and men with uh, hernias the size of a balloon uh, that they'd never been able to have repaired. Uh, it was the age of trusses, when you'd see this balloon with a truss on top of it. People nowadays who, who talk as though we didn't really need a health service, uh, they just have absolutely no idea of how it was. <laughs> Decades of neglect were taking their toll on Bevan's baby. So far, the National Health Service has been getting along remarkably smoothly. In the pre-NHS world, few people could afford dental treatment and simply let their teeth rot away. Britain's 9,000 dentists found themselves swamped. 33 million dentures were issued in the first year at a cost to the nation of almost 20 million pounds. Millions of you have got the spectacles you needed. The rush for glasses, too, became a runaway burden to the health service. Production couldn't keep up. Soon, there was a six-month waiting list. And tens of millions of you have visited the doctor under the scheme and got your medicine. With prescriptions increasing fourfold to 240 million, it was clear Bevan's new service was becoming a victim of its own success. There's no danger whatever that the National Health Service will break down. The government tried to put a cap on the NHS spending. In the first year, I think it was 179 million. In the next year, it was 240 million or something like that. And then the next year, they capped it at 352 million. And it was at that stage that they began to realize that the thing was running away with itself. It's ridiculous looking back. 
that uh, there was a feeling that the introduction of a national health service would improve the health of the nation so much that after it was introduced, the actual cost would come down. The cost continued to escalate because of the steady developments in medicine, which inevitably were more costly. Yet despite the drain on the public purse and the agonizing six-month battle over its birth, the changes that Bevan's NHS made to Britain's health were immediate and dramatic. The health service started in an atmosphere of friction, of controversy, of doubt and of great hopes. There has gone on in the past a vast amount of silent suffering, a vast amount of, uh, of remediable pain. And I believe in Great Britain we have made a great start. Within just 10 years, infant mortality had halved. Life expectancy increased dramatically. Death from infectious diseases had fallen by over 80%. For many, the NHS was not merely Nye Bevan's finest hour, but the greatest political achievement of the century. The NHS was a great achievement. What was achieved was the basis from which we could go forward. What was happening could not go on. It had to change. There is a degree of altruism in the NHS that it's really very difficult to find in anything else, he says. Here is something that society has decided to do for itself, to make sure that no single member of its number falls through the cracks in the floorboards. I mean, I mean it's, a, it's a very noble way for a society to live. It's Nybevan's NHS. And I think that people of my generation will never let that go. We talk about national treasures. What could be better than free health care delivered to everybody, to you and your children and their children? I think it was wonderful and I'm glad to have been part of it from its conception, you might say till now and I wish it well on its 60th. Panorama reports on the NHS and its struggle not to be put up for sale. That's Monday nights at 8.30 on BBC One. Up next here on BBC Two, highlights of the women's final between the Williams sisters today at Wimbledon. <laughs>